two years ago we, we were selected by the international organization to be the only representatives of India to certify addiction counselors. That means, basically this is what it means. If anybody in India wants to become an addiction counselor, they had to go through life channel. We were selected for that. So two years ago we started that, but that was a purely non-biblical psychological training. But God has changed things around, so now we let go of that certification. We contacted the agency and we let go of that certification. Now we are not the agency. We don't want to be the only certifying agency here for that kind of counseling. Because we believe biblical addiction counseling is what we need. So that is why we have invited Dr. Troy and the Word of Life and uh, Mrs. Rose to come. And so we are doing 15 hours of training. Each session will be one hour. So uh, there will be a 40 minute lecture along with PowerPoint and then I will come up and then we will have about 15 to 20 minutes of any questions that we have during the training. So that gives you opportunity to case okay, there are any phrases you don't understand, that is a plan. Okay? So uh, to start off, I wanted to give you the truth about addiction so that all of you will understand what addiction is. I know all of you know what addiction is but we definitely have to give you a a basis of what addiction is. So this is a seminar that Life Challenge has done in over 60 cities in India. We've gone to 60 cities, done this in colleges, schools, public places, community halls. So I'm going to just run, take you through this. The first point I want you to uh, understand, the goal of this seminar is, the three days training is, I believe that God has brought all of you here so that you can start to fight the enemy of addiction in this country. Life Challenge is one of the few organizations who is doing a national fight against this enemy. So by the time I finish and by the time we go through the seminar, you will understand what a huge enemy we are fighting and how small the resources are or how small the people are. So uh, my, my hope is that all of you, by the time we finish the training, will not only have a, uh, a certificate in your hand, but also you will be involved directly in fighting this enemy. That is our, our goal. So the first thing to understand is it's an enemy. Addiction is a very, very powerful enemy. Uh, the reason why we stress on that is because many of the college students, school students, they think it's a friend. Somebody introduces alcohol and drugs as a means of joy or happiness or party, whatever the situation is, they think it's a friend. But in reality, it's, a, it's an enemy in disguise. It's a ruthless enemy. The reason why I say ruthless is, it has no mercy on the victim. It will completely destroy the family, the individual, so it's an addiction is a ruthless and powerful enemy. The reason I have those two pictures on the screen is one is a very famous person. Do I, does anybody know who he is? Okay, so that's Michael Jackson. Very famous, very rich. I think he pretty much had everything he, he wanted. Uh, Anything he wants. I saw once he walked into a store and there were thousands of people just waiting to see him. Some people fainted as soon as they saw him. One concert he came and he just came and stood like this. In the front row, 25 people fainted. <laughs> they brought ambulance, stretchers, they carried him out. Uh, he, he's, on a, he's on a different level. But he died as an addict. One of the worst addicts in the world. He had a doctor to stay with him 24 hours and inject him with what they give inside the hospital surgery unit was what he was taking. Without that he cannot sleep. So that is Michael Jackson. On the other side is a man that you don't know, I also don't know. I saw him on the road in Jamshedpur, lying on the side of the road, alcoholic. I took a photograph of that. The reason is addiction will affect the most famous to the unknown, rich to poor, male or female, city or village. It has no barrier. Addiction affects all kinds of people, all society. So you can have a, a woman from a village or you can have a rich business, businessman. All of them can be equally affected by addiction. The Bible says, in the end it will bite like a snake. This is in Proverbs. There is an entire chapter on that. In the end it will bite like a snake. It stings like a viper. Because many people give a lot of excuses for their alcohol, especially if you take 
working people they will say i have a very tough job and i am not an addict i just take a little bit in the evening i relax and i go to sleep well you can have all the excuses but in the end it bites like a snake and stings like a viper i also have a quote here from atma gandhi this is what he said about alcohol and it's very rare to have heads of state or people come out so strongly against addiction but he is one person who did that he said that enemy of mankind that curse of civilization so he was very very strict about that and that's why he brought prohibition in gujarat and that's still there one state in india that still has prohibition is because of mahatma gandhi and his influence unfortunately that influence is not there in india but he was a person who said that so there are three areas that that i have identified that addiction affects three areas first one is self destruction the individual person who is taking drugs and alcohol it completely destroys him self destruction the number of stories of people whose lives have been completely destroyed by addiction you can read that every day everywhere self destruction this is just a little bit of medical information just for you to understand when you take alcohol or drugs it is absorbed into the blood and the blood blood flows all over the body so that the poison goes into every part of the body it touches every organ but the liver that is trying to remove it it does a very thorough job but does it very slowly if you drink a glass of alcohol it is not going to remove it immediately so in the meanwhile what happens this poison is circulating all over the body affecting all parts of the body slowly the effect comes down but as a result this poison has affected all the organs i wanted to just watch this uh, series of photographs this is of a study that was done in england for a meth addict there's a drug called meth so this lady was taking this drug so they took a study on her so they took a photograph of her every every couple of years just to watch her and so this is the this is the lady when she started off slowly the 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 drug beginning to start, was beginning to affect her body so this is a series of photographs there have been a few studies done like this and i think uh, after this one uh, either they couldn't track her or i'm not sure what happened but the lady on the other side is it's not age that is showing up there it is actually the effect of drugs on her body addiction affects a person in a very deep way if you see a young man taking drugs alcohol his life within 5 years 10 years 15 years will age so much more affected so much more all areas he it begins to destroy so that is the power of addiction so the first area it affects is self destruction second area is family devastation it affects the whole family it is not a solo drug i used to run teen challenge centers in in the us one day one boy he was 19 years old he said what's your problem i said why i am taking drugs and i am destroying myself why are you trying to keep me here so i said well this is not just about you this is a family it affects the whole family it's a family disease later we will look at that it's a family disease so there are we run life challenge run uh, recovery programs in india we have 150 beds many families come wives come and cry and say please put my husband inside he is because of his alcoholism our entire family is destroyed the money is gone there is abuse in the family there are so many issues because it's a family disease if a, if your society if the indian society has 10 crore addicts that means 10 crore families see sometimes we forget that entire family is affected so that's the second part the family devastation is abuse of wives and children <coughs> unstable homes children have a like high likelihood of falling into addiction because of their father's addiction high levels of stress in the home depression in the home loneliness among children women usually have self hatred they avoid society <coughs> many women have to do a dual parent role because they have to be father and mother we have a ministry in kasimedu in chennai that is a bush fisherman colony and there i almost every week there is suicide or murder 
just in a small car, uh, fisherman's car. Suicide from wives because they are fed up of the husband's addiction. And then there is murder because of all kinds of addiction related things. So, then children have school problems, children have low self esteem. Children of alcoholic or, uh, or addicts, they have very low self esteem because when they come home, their home situation is completely different from their classmates' home situation. They don't have the facility to study. The, the environment at home is not a, a facility to study. So they are probably behind on their homework. There are a lot of problems children of alcoholics and children of addicts have. Guilt, fears. So this is just that family devastation. I am just mentioning all these things that uh, you will try to understand what addiction is. Third area is social damage and danger. So the first one is self-destruction. Second one is family devastation. The third one is social damage and danger. Society as a whole is affected by addiction. Not only in India, but all over the world, society has been heavily affected by addiction. The world governments have spent so much money trying to find addiction. Some estimates say they have spent more money than World War I and World War II put together. That means to fight World War I and World War II, how much of money they have spent. The world governments have put more money than that in fighting this enemy. Because this enemy is so powerful. It is not, this enemy is not hiding in Afghanistan in some cave. This enemy is there in the schools, in the homes, in the society, open. It is sold in the liquor stores. There are, uh, drug dealing is a multi-billion dollar industry. See, Colombia for example is selling drugs to the world, cocaine. Colombia bought a old submarine from Russia, old war submarine, just for taking drugs. So they are using an old submarine to move drugs from Colombia to the US. That means it's a multi-billion dollar, multi -billion dollar industry. It's affecting society. Uh, there are different effects of society. We have uh, drunken driving and all kinds of things. But I just want to show you one thing. This uh, down below is a X-ray of a person. Uh, he was. This was in Oregon, USA. He went to the doctor and he said he got a headache. So they checked him up and they took an X-ray and they found 12 one-inch nails stuck in his head. One-inch nails, 12 of them stuck in his head. That's the X-ray right you see, what you see. So the doctor asked him, "What is that?" <coughs> He said, I am a meth addict. I haven't slept for many days. So he took a drill gun and he put 12 nails into his own head. So how he is alive, I don't know. That's God's grace. But for a fellow to do 12 nails into his own head, that shows the control of drugs on him. Also it shows one more thing. If a person can do that into his own head, what do you think he can do to other people? That's why we have violent crime. You know, violent crime means if you go to some of the jails, I, we, have, we have prison ministry from Life Challenge, we go to jails, I was just two days ago, I was in Kota jail. Uh, so there you have violent criminals and many of them have confessed, especially those who are contract killers, who they send out to murder somebody. One of the first things they do is they drink a lot and then they get that feeling and they chop. So that is violent crime all related to addiction. Uh, this is a picture of the same person. One is before the accident, one is after the accident. She was hit by a drunk driver. So the captain says, not everyone who gets hit by a drunk driver dies. Some people are alive and they are alive like this. All over India, we have a lot of people who are affected by addiction. Uh, just every day, if you see, now the newspapers stopped reporting that actually. Before they used to report. Nowadays they don't report. Drunk driver, lorry hits, they don't report right anymore. They are busy with other things. But everywhere, all over India, we see a lot of women. Uh, once I saw, uh, I read an article, uh, I think I was in Hyderabad, and then I read the article that the van was going, they hit. So, two, three women broke their backs. That means permanently, that's it. Why? Somebody was drinking, somebody was driving. But the effect on society. Prisons, um, addiction is the underlying cause of today's society's problems. It is the underlying cause. There is no other evil that is greater in society than addiction. Then you might be wondering how come people are not talking so much about addiction. Because it's not easy to handle addiction. 
You can't go and quick, just go and talk to a person and change it. If somebody is poor, you can kind of give him some money as you feel that you, you temporarily solve the problem. But addiction is underlying, you can't easily solve it. So that's why society is not talking about it. But it is a, it is a foundational problem for crime, for gangs, for HIV, AIDS in India, we have the highest in the world. But that is because of addiction, injection, drug use or behavior, under drunken behavior. 75% that, that number is actually 75% of the prisons are there, people in the prisons are there because of addiction related crime. Addiction is the number one cause of all of that. Uh, addiction causes imbalance in priorities. So if you take an alcoholic, you can look at his family, his job, his career, his children and then he can, he can look at addiction on one side and he just drops this and goes behind addiction. That's the power of addiction. Uh, so why is it so powerful? Why can't a person stop? Well, we will be learning that in the coming sessions. But just a quick picture, this is just a photograph of the image of the brain. This is a normal 43 year old and the other side is an alcoholic 43 year old. This is the image of the brain. So, you can see the difference. There is a lot of, uh, looks like black spots in the brain. How it works exactly, how the thinking works, you know, we, the brain study is Human beings have not really understood too much about the brain. As they learn, they keep saying it and then, you know, it's a very complicated part of the body. But that's just shrinking of the brain. After 40 years, it says irreversible. So, if you have an alcoholic who is 50, 60 years old, it's, it's, it's more difficult for him to change. But, you know, God does miracles. And we have seen that happen. But I'm just giving you the, the scientific side. Um, so, in India, we have 7.2, now it's about 10 crore people. In India, who are struggling with addiction, that means 10 crore families, if we just calculate it, there's about 1 out of 5 families directly affected by addiction. But the numbers are much higher. You can go to, I challenge you, you can go to any village, simply ask them, do you have any alcohol problem? We ask them. They say, sometimes they ask me, what a question you are asking? <laughs> what do you mean, do you have an alcohol problem? <coughs> Every house is an alcohol. In some places, if you go. This is the effect on children. This is uh, child labor. You know, in India, we have child labor. Many of the runaway street children, they run away. Why? Because their fathers are alcoholics, because of abuse they run away. Uh, then you have children being sold, then you have girls being sold. See, there is a lot of, I think there are a lot of wonderful ministries on human trafficking. You hear a lot about human trafficking and other things. But behind that is the power of addiction. Every person who goes behind the addiction, every person who gets involved in that, they are all under the poison and control of addiction. It's a very powerful industry. Un Challenged. Addiction has been going unchallenged. There are many organizations working in India, it's very few. So, this is the first time we are trying something like this, but hopefully, in the coming years, we will be able to get more and more people passionate about fighting this war. Addiction is a disease. That's a scientific term again. I want to say it's like a disease. It's a disease of the body, of the mind. So, uh, the American, I think it's called the American Association. Uh, so they come up with a definition for addiction. So they used to call it a biopsychosocial disease, but now they've added biopsychosocial spiritual disease. They added that. I, I read that last year. So now they added the spiritual part. Now, so that gives us the freedom to talk about spiritual things. I don't know how they are going to answer the spiritual disease part. I don't know what they use. They use higher power and different things, but it's a disease that affects all areas of a, of a human being. It's a progressive and chronic disease. That means, just like if you have diabetes or heart problem, if you don't treat it, progressive means it will progress worse and worse. That's what progressive means. As time goes on, it will become worse and worse and worse. Chronic means you, you will die. It will fatal. It will kill you. So it's a progressive and chronic disease. But it should not be an excuse for an alcoholic saying, oh, I, I, I have a disease, so I'm going to keep drinking. That's why I don't like to call it a disease like that. I don't like to tell an alcoholic, oh, brother, you have a disease. Then he, he sometimes takes out and says, oh, I have a disease. So it's not an excuse for using alcohol. It's just for us to understand. It's like a disease. Am I being clear? Yes. It's a family disease. It's a, not a personal, just a personal disease. It's a family disease. Women and children are victims. There are a lot of women who are forced to labor and all kinds of other hard work because of their <coughs> husband's alcoholism. A lot of abuse goes on in India because of addiction. 
These are all just photographs have, we have taken in the ministry. This lady was, a knife was thrown at her by her husband. A lot of children are there because of addiction. These are the street children. So this is this is how we started the ministry and uh, that's, the, that's the story of life challenge. I hope all of you have understood what we are trying to talk about for the next three days. Um, it's a great enemy and I'm hoping that all of you will be able to grasp as much as we can. Uh, it's 15 hours, 15 sessions in three days is a little, little heavy. But you have a PowerPoint, we have, we have given you the slides, you can take notes and we'll have the video also, you can, you can watch that again. But the most important thing is, this is the most important thing, I'm just hoping that you will make a decision to get involved in your own way, in your own churches. So on the third day, on Saturday, we'll be showing you how you can do this ministry in your own churches. We're not saying that all of you have to start a life channel residential home, but we're saying that in your church, how can you help those who are struggling with addiction around your church? That's what we are trying to teach. So from here when you go, you can start a small group in your church, you can start a small group in your home, you can start small groups if you are passionate about it. We don't want to put any restriction on, on, on who can do it. If you are passionate, if you have paid attention in the three days, then we want to help you to start a small group. And those that you cannot handle, then you can send them to Life Challenge Center. Then we have a residence room for that. So those who you can handle, you will handle. So that's that's the goal of the three days. Any questions? We're going to need a lot of your help in this seminar. Because this is my first time in India. So just assume we know nothing. We don't understand your culture. What we're going to be doing is, see, God has worked in our lives and taught us a lot of things over the last 15 or 20 years about this particular subject. And we're going to be sharing that with you. But as God taught us, we fit into our culture. Your culture has differences. So the question is, how can we take what God has given us, give it to you, and then modify it in such a way that it is useful to you? We're here to help you guys, to partner with you guys, to help out Life Challenge to actually get a training school going here to train people here in India. But we have to admit, we're pretty much ignorant about your culture. We're going to make some changes and try and adapt, but you're the ones that are going to have to help us to say, how can we take what God gave us, and then you can apply it in your churches, in Life Challenge, and other places like this. As I said on this slide, our objective is to share what we have learned that might be applicable to biblical counseling in the treatment of addictions in India. Now particularly we have this on PowerPoint because we realize some of you may not be able to understand me and I'll try to talk slow. Okay, and hopefully you can read on the PowerPoint what we're talking about here as we go along. Now realize again, I, the research that I've done on this, I've done on the internet, I haven't been here so you know much better than I know about the addiction problems in India. But I wanted to learn something about it and get some statistics here uh, that we have. The judicial family is breaking down in India according to the internet, resulting in problems, many problems, and up to a 900% increase in divorce in India. India had the lowest divorce rate, or the absolute lowest one. But as things are changing, unfortunately, as things have gotten westernized, it's our fault. <laughs> They've gotten westernized and then more divorces come in. What do you think the statistic is in America for divorce? Around 50% of people have been divorced in America. That's how bad it has gotten there. Domestic violence. At least 55% of unmarried women and 66% of married women have been victims of domestic violence here in India. A statistic that we use in our own domestic violence program is that 80% of domestic violence is alcohol related. Sexual abuse, as many as 70% of married women in India between the age of 15 and 49 are victims of beating, rape, or forced sex. Those are high numbers. The huge diversity in religions and traditions make resolving problems like this extremely difficult. But one of the positive things is that counseling has grown more and more in acceptance in India. 
So let's look at alcoholism here. It is increasing. 21% of adult men and around 2% of women drink. But the problem is that's about the same as the United States. But the problem is that most of them, at least half of them, drink to the point of intoxication. So it's not just a few drinks. Most of them have a real drinking problem. 14 million drinkers need help. You think maybe we need a few people to help? Like Brother Vinish was saying, uh, how are we going to reach all the people of India? I'm suggesting it starts with the church. I'm suggesting that there are more churches than there are alcohol centers or anything else. And so if you can do what we do, where we have a fully licensed drug alcohol outpatient clinic in our church, and you can start the same way you started. You know how we started? One support group. And that one support group then led to more people in the groups. We actually started with one, and we called it the uh, addictions and codependency. I'll explain codependency later. Uh, and it grew, so it split into two groups, and then into three groups. And then people in the group wanted individual counseling, so we had to train counselors. So out of all that, we had to get our own institute because there wasn't much out there on truly biblical counseling. You're going to find out today that everything we do is based completely on the Bible. That's what we fit totally into the church of everything that we do. Only we have to go deeper in the Bible than those people have done and gone in the past. Sale of alcohol has increased 8% in the last three years. 95% is in, different for India consume spirits, not just beer. America has a lot of beer. But here, the majority of people are drinking hard alcohol. Consequences of drinking. More than 20% of hospital admissions are due to alcohol. 18% of psychiatric emergencies. More than 20% of all brain injuries. And 60% of all injuries reported in emergency rooms are alcohol related. A third of violent a husband's drink. The poor slums, one thing that's just interesting to me is they said one of the things that's happening in the slum areas now is people are actually drinking more than they make in their salary. Where is that going to go for their families? It's more than they make in their salary that they're spending on drinking or spending on drugs. Drug epidemics in some areas, especially in the northern states, uh, states of uh, Punjab, okay. Uh, with more than 70% of its young people abusing drugs, heavy drugs like heroin, opium, alcohol, or marijuana. 13.2% are below age 20. So there's a great need for biblical addictions counting in India. That's the reason we came. Uh, the National uh, India Drug Addictions Program uh, funded 483 detoxification in 90 counseling centers. Almost half the attendees are being treated for alcohol dependency, but the success of these secular programs is very low. Doctors working with addicts in government hospitals report a complete lack of non-pharmacologist care and training. Once we treated them, there's no social worker, so we just send them to AA as Alcoholics Anonymous, it comes from the United States. It started out absolutely biblical, directly from the Bible. But to draw more people in, they decided instead of trusting in God and Jesus Christ, that they were going to trust in some higher power. You know that the higher power can be your doorknob? I don't know what your doorknob is going to do for you, but that's, uh, it can be anything, it can be the group. And so their effectiveness is dropped hugely as to what they can uh, do. Since Jesus was replaced by a higher power, an AA survey showed that 81% quit the program in the first year. So that means 81% that come are not being helped. 33% of those that continued and remain in the program remain absent over 10 years. So it still is helping to a certain degree because they still have some biblical principles that are built into it, even though they're really not relying on Christ. Another study found that those staying had a 49.5% year, one-year abstinence rate compared to a 24.5% and they were untreated. So again, that means it only helped about 25%. And 
in our drug alcohol program that uh, 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 Rose, who uh, runs our drug alcohol program, has a around a 90% success rate one year after treatment. So it shows you the difference when you really are relying on Jesus instead of on something else. Cognitive behavior therapy, that means how you think, just secular treatment, has a 37% recovery rate, to give you an idea. The model that we have produced here is based on the church. We don't do anything that you cannot do in your church. In fact, we've kept ourselves small. We didn't want to grow because we want to be a model that we can just say, if you want to do this in the church, we're doing it. We're not doing anything. We don't have big funds. In fact, our entire counseling center uh, is self-sufficient. We don't get one penny from the church. In fact, we give the church a 10% of the money that comes into our counseling center. And that way, if the church has problems, we don't get eliminated. As, as something that they don't really need in the church. Uh, we have licensed marriage and family therapy, uh, our drug and alcohol clinic, uh, court approved batters intervention, court approved sexual offenders, uh, parenting courses. Uh, let me tell you a couple stories of two ladies uh, to give you an idea of the thing and what God can do. This first lady, uh, she wouldn't mind me bringing this up, her name is Bonnie, and she had a rough life. In fact, she had her first baby in prison. And she had a fairly rough husband. He came home one day because he ran out of bullets. He had killed four people and he needed more bullets to go back and kill the last witness. He is in prison for the rest of his life. I believe she was on heroin. And she was on heroin. And she came to our program and she got help but to get the help, she had to walk through our sanctuary to get back to where the support group was. And she kept walking through the sanctuary, and as she got help, she eventually came to our church, and she eventually got trained, and now she's a licensed drug alcohol counselor, and she runs one of our support groups. Another lady, she was a prostitute. In fact, she went by the street name A Star. And the way it all happened is she was selling herself in front of the house of one of the people that came to our church. So this lady went out and said, uh, uh, you, you, know, uh, you know, can I help you tell them about Jesus? She wasn't interested at all. So the lady says to her, how much do you get for a trip? And she gave him a number, maybe $50 or something. She said, I'm buying you. I'm paying you $50 for $50, you have to go to church. And so she got the $50, so she went to church, and she got saved, and she was on all sorts of drugs and everything else. I think she's also on methadone treatment and so on, and she got totally delivered. Uh, today, she actually left the area because she went down to help her mom, but she's married, she's totally delivered, living for God. Those are the kind of things that God can do when you somehow get them in there. What's the reason that we have them in the church? Because we believe this is all integrated, that this is all part of salvation means to be made completely whole. We're going to get into that a lot later. And so, and so to be made whole, this is part of being made whole. This is one of the dumbest, most strongholds that people cannot really break out of by themselves. Uh, Right now, what we're doing is that we've been helping different people start counseling centers around the United States. In the last years, we've started a center. We have uh, a whole church that's actually training about 20 or 30 people in their church in North Carolina. We have a center now in Nigeria. We have a center in Kenya. And we're hoping to see you guys take the ball and run with it and start doing things here in India. That's the reason that we came. But the question is, does this really belong in the church? How many of you sort of come from a denomination or some area that basically we want nothing to do with counseling, right? Because you're afraid it's going to be secular. Instead of using counseling, although I'm going to use the term I want you to say in your head, Bible application. Counseling equals Bible application because everything will be directed directly from the Bible. We have Bible verses to back up everything we do. In fact, God gave it to us over the period of the last 20 years 
because we didn't feel that it was being done in the area of biblical counseling, and we didn't want what was being done in secular counseling, so a lot of this is going to be new. You maybe never heard it before. We published four books, and we have books on a table over here you can look at uh, some of the addiction uh, counseling that we have. Another good news is there are a lot of good materials now that you can just take one of our books uh, and just use that and we'll give you the entire curriculum. All the Bible verses are right there. It puts it all together for you. But what does the Bible tell us? This is Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called, what? Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor. Counselor. <coughs> the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So if Jesus did it, do you think it's okay for us? Isaiah 11, 2. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, that is, Jesus, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel, and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. This is what Jesus said about his ministry. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set up liberty in them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I couldn't describe counseling any better than that. Because that's what it's all about. is helping people, delivering the captive, healing the brokenhearted, setting the captive free, setting people at liberty. And Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, that is, mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what the church is all about. So where does counseling fit in the church? In the leadership of the church. In fact, we suggest that every church needs at least a pastor that has adequate training. <coughs> How many of you pastors have had more than one course of counseling? I've seen a lot of hands. Okay? That's because most seminaries or training schools give you almost no counseling. And so what do most pastors do in counseling? You give some advice based on your experience. And what if you weren't a drug addict or an alcoholic before? What are you going to tell the people? You know what most pastors tell them? Try harder. You know what's the absolute worst thing you can say to an addict that will actually make them worse? In fact, it's so bad that if I get somebody in there that's in denial and they'll say, well, no, I can just drink a little bit and I'm not really addicted, you know what I'll tell them? Let's run an experiment. I want you to go home and I don't want you to drink anything or even think about drinking for the next week. I want you to try really hard not to drink or not to even think about drinking. You know what I know is going to happen? They're going to drink more that week than they ever drank for the rest of their life. <laughs> and they're going to be finally convinced that they really have a problem. Because the harder you try, we're going to find out when we talk about addictions, what are they doing? They're trying. It's their effort. It's their flesh. They're trying to make themselves okay. So we're trying to try harder. But if you don't have this training, if you don't understand these things, you're going to be telling them exactly the wrong thing to do. You mean messing them up worse, but that's what most pastors actually do. Now, another thing that we actually teach here is what we call Bible-based life coaching, which is the same thing as discipleship. Now, why do we do that? And I'm giving you sort of an overview of what we do. The idea here is we're going to start with addiction counseling, but I'm believing that you guys are going to end up doing full training in all the types of counseling in the church and so on, and in Christian counseling eventually. But... One time God spoke to me and this is what he said. You're only helping about a fourth of the people in the church. I said, oh, well, about a fourth of them have the kind of problems that you're dealing with here. How about the three-fourths of the people in the church? How are you helping them? <coughs> because what do they need? They need someone to help them find out what their call of God is and help them to get into the ministry. And that's what Bible-based life coaching is, discipling people 
to be effective in the church. So do you see our counseling center covers everybody in the church in some aspects. If they're doing well, we'll disciple them to do better. If they're struggling, we'll help remove the roadblocks that are stopping the process of salvation from working in their lives. So we try to do everything. Okay? How can these needs be met? Through either Bible-based <coughs> counseling or Bible-based life coaching. What are the options in the church? Well, you have pastoral counseling, uh, Christian support groups, Bible-based life coaching programs, lay counseling programs. Lay counseling simply means somebody doesn't have enough, they're not a professionally trained counselor, they have what we offer like a certification, and they are helping people for free in the church. We, we work in our church, uh, some of the pastors will give you a couple sessions of advice, but if it's a major problem, they'll send them to the counseling center. <coughs> Degree Christian counselors, anger and domestic violence programs, licensed drug and alcohol, alcohol programs, and parenting classes. We offer that all as an integral part of our church to people. And we do charge for our fees and so on, that's how we're supported. But people will pay enough for those different things that we can be totally self-sufficient and our counselors get paid and so on and so forth. But see, we help everybody. Anyone that comes through the door, if they don't have money, if they don't have finances, we send them to our students, our lay counselors, but we still supervise the lay counselors. If they come in uh, and they have medical insurance, we can take the medical insurance. So we can cover all these things. We don't expect you're gonna start there. The place we always start is with a support group in the church, which is what we're going to be talking about most of the time here. We're not going to get into all these different issues. What are the what are the key benefits in learning to counsel? You carry out God's call to heal the brokenhearted and set the captive free. In other words, you're just learning how to really effectively apply the Bible in the life of people and their lives are changed. You fill the gap to do what's missing in the church and the society to help people Find their calling, perfect the saints. That's the Bible-based life coaching. You draw people into your church by meeting their needs through counseling, life coaching, and support groups so they can get saved. We believe this is the most effective way, one of the most effective ways of evangelism. Everything we do in our church is evangelism. Every program we're going to give you has evangelism built directly into it because think of this. What if I help somebody and I make them more effective in their life, but I don't get them saved. Have I really helped them? I'm just making a better rat for the rat race of life that's going to hell. So, and we believe, see, what does salvation mean? He's made completely whole. And we want to make them completely whole, so salvation is based directly in everything that we do. And you're going to find you will draw a lot of people into your church to get saved. We get people from other churches in fact, a number of our counselors and support group leaders aren't even from our church. We have uh, uh, about three-fourths of the clients who don't come from our church. They come from other churches. And we help them out because we're working for the body of Christ, not just for us. We're not building our own empire. This is all for the uh, kingdom of God. Lay counselors can relieve your pastor of the impossible job of doing all the long-term counseling life coaching so we can concentrate on his job to preach and teach. And we prove that Jesus is the answer even to life's difficult problems. You realize what we've been doing? I don't know if it's here in India like it is in America. But most pastors, if they get somebody that comes in and they have a really difficult problem, like a mental health problem or schizophrenia or something like that, what does the pastor do? Refers them to a secular counselor. Refers them to a psychiatrist refers them to somebody else. And by that, what are we saying? We don't have the answers. We don't have the answers. We believe those answers are in the Bible. What do we conclude here? We need Bible-based life counseling and life coaching. In order for this to happen, Christians need solid Bible-based clinical and sound training. We need Bible schools to provide these degree programs. We need solid teaching materials to see that happen. Uh, Word of Life Counseling Training Institute. This should be just a little snapshot here uh, mm -hmm. rather than uh, get too much detail here. But this is what we're doing right now. What we're saying is 
We started out with just a support group. It has God gave us more and more. It grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. Here's some pictures of Word of Life Training Institute. It's all, we call it faith therapy. It's all derived directly from the Bible. It's based on the process of salvation by faith. It uses biblical models and principles. In-depth answers to difficult problems. And it's easy to use and taught in Bible schools and churches. Why? Because if you know your Bible, all we have to do is show you how it works, and you already have all the information you need. We don't have to teach you Adler or Freud or any of the other interesting theories that people have come up with uh, over the ages. We can just take your Bible and say, this is, this is what this story means right here. You see that? God's saying this, 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 and this. This is what you need to do here. So do you see the idea there? This is what we offer. A full curriculum of 16 <coughs> counseling and life coaching courses. Uh, we also sometimes use courses from the American Association of Christian Counselors. Uh, certification in pastoral, lay counseling, addiction counseling, and life coaching. What does that mean? You can take just five courses and a practicum. This is practical. You've got to do it. And we will give you a certification. Now, we're believing that Life Challenge is going to be providing those certifications. Okay, right now, uh, we do that. Uh, it can eventually lead to diplomas, <coughs> and bachelor's, and master's degrees through Logos Christian College and Graduate School. We have supervision available, and we will help you develop your own training school. We've done a lot in the United States, except we're just branching out into more English-speaking countries right now. We're in the process of trying to get our books translated into Spanish so we can reach out in that particular of the world, particular way of the world also. So what do these things look for? So I'm rapidly just going to go through these. But a pastor or lay counseling certification, you only take five courses. These are the courses. Faith therapy. Faith therapy deals with the deeper issues inside the person of how salvation works, self-worth, significance, love, and security. And we're going to be going into these courses and grabbing certain pieces of them and putting a very uh, concise program together for you, taking a separate a bunch of our courses and integrating them here as we go along. Effective counseling and coaching skills. Transformation. It's based on one of my books that gives you Bible models of how to handle all the major difficult problems in the church. Revelation and Set You Free is another course that goes through the eight steps of spiritual growth based on 2 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> An entire course on that. We have books over here you can look at, four of which is I've written. And so on. Principles for life. Okay, we have the basic problems. We have the, the complex problems. But how about problems that are not answered in the Bible? Because see, those we take directly from the Bible. Say, see the story of this guy? This is how it works. But how about the ones like uh, everyone here have a borderline personality disorder? Well, it's one of the most difficult mental health problems that there is. How are we going to handle that? Because it's not in the Bible. We haven't found one yet. Well, we teach you 77 biblical principles, and then we use a model out of Proverbs chapter uh, uh, 3 5 of how to build counseling plans using biblical principles for anything. And so you'll learn how to do that. That's the principles for life course. And then we require a 30 hour practicum. That means you've got to be counseling people, and you have to have somebody supervising you that knows what they're doing so you don't hurt them. No. And you learn how to do this, and you're doing it right. And we even do that over the internet. So those are the programs are sort of like. We also, just for information, have what we call developing country scholarships in India qualifies. That means we give this all to you at our cost. And even the school that grants our degrees has agreed to do that. So it's extremely low cost. Now we really aren't looking to recruit you guys okay for our internet program. We're looking to recruit you guys as Life Challenge gets these things going here because it's much better to take them in residence than to take something over the internet. <coughs> this is the Addictions Counseling Certification. The difference is instead of the basic skills, we teach you the group counseling. And we're going to give you the essential parts of that in this seminar this time. And you still have the Transformation course, but we add in our Counseling Addictions course and Counseling Codependency. We're going to be talking about that, but the idea here, it actually about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, when they would have people go into an inpatient program for drug alcohol, 
they would do just fine within about 30 days, and they would go home and relapse. So they said, what's going on here? So they went and studied the families, and they found out that the family is addicted to the husband using the alcohol, and it was all a pattern. And since then, this whole idea has expanded out, and the way we understand it today, it's excessive dependence or independence, the two ditches, from people or things. And we'll talk about that on a whole section and just on that to explain that to you from the Bible. Do you know what the Bible term for codependency is? Any ideas? It's idolatry. Because you see, either you are so independent that I myself and I can handle it all myself and I'm my own God doing my own thing, or I'm finding a God here on earth to make life okay for me to meet all my needs according to their riches and glory. Now that's different in different societies, but in the beginning it applies to India when it's extreme. You see what I'm saying? It's based on your culture as to whether it's extreme or not and whether you're actually turning somebody into your God instead of relying on God or you're making yourself into a God. You can handle it all yourself and you don't need God. And you're dealing with it through your flesh. Here's the Bible-based life coaching certification. I'm not going to go into that, but we have a whole course as to how to disciple people, how to help them find their calling, how to help them plan how they're going to achieve their calling through God as God calls them. It's a whole other area you guys can get into if you choose to do that. Here's the bachelor's degree to give you an idea. Uh, Logos requires 120 credit hours, but they give credit for previous college, give credit for life experience, give credit for ministry experience, and even for how well you know your Bible. Which means it knocks a lot of credits off so you can get the degree fairly rapidly. To give you an idea that possibly you could get an entire degree for $1,650 online or by DVD for about $2,050. If you already have a bachelor's degree, you can get a master's degree in this for $1,000 online or $1,100. as an entire master's degree to Logos Christian College and Graduate School. But we believe that we're going to have that whole program here in India, and you'll be able to attend classes right here in India that way and all be connected and have this all together. That's the level that we're at at this particular point. And so we have students throughout the world from different countries that are taking our courses and getting their degrees or certifications in different places. So what's the next step? You've got to decide. Hey, I can come up here and say all sorts of things about our programs and that kind of stuff, but the question is, do you really care about hurting and lost people? Do you care about addicted people? I'm guessing you do and you wouldn't be here. Do you really want to learn how to help? You can do a certain degree by just, if you don't have any experience, by just helping people. Let me tell you a little fast story about that, though, to show you the need. This isn't in the notes, okay? I was in the Air Force, you might talk about that later, but I was stationed in Colorado Springs. And a neighbor just moved in next to us, and about 6 o'clock in the evening, the bell was ringing, just ring, 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 ring. And we went to the, uh, to the door, and there was a young man standing in there and said, said, call 911. That's the emergency number in America. My mom just put a knife in my dad's chest. And so we ran across over there, we called 911. The guy was laying on the floor, just absolutely pale, been stabbed in the chest. An ambulance got there, the hospital was only three or four blocks away, and the, the doctor said, another 20 minutes and he would have been dead. So what did we do? I realized we weren't counselors at that time, okay? But we were very dedicated to the church. We knew our Bible as far as we knew it, and we wanted to help. So we led them to the Lord. And we got him into our church, which was a little bit too much more for them. They really didn't want to go that far. And, and we got to be friends with them over a period of time. And we would get a call, and you know, she was in the hospital. She fell in the ice and broke her arm. And then a while later, we get another call, and she had a black eye. And we missed it. And they called us one time and said, hey, come on over, invite us over. We came over. They had all new furniture. They had a brand new car. And after the barbecue, they said, I'm going to tell you what happened. We're at the bar, and 
we were drinking and the wife got jealous and got some guys and he went out to fight them. And in the fight, they kicked his eye out. And they got all that money from decapitation because he was now blind. And not knowing counseling, what do you think we said to him? This is getting serious. You guys, you guys better split up or better do something. They were getting help. This guy was in the army, so he was getting secular counseling help to a certain degree. But see, we didn't understand. This was a codependent situation. It was a domestic violence situation. It was an addiction situation. If you don't know how to deal with those things, you really can't help them. And that's what we learned the hard way. We didn't know enough. We needed more understanding of these things to be able to really help these kind of people with these kind of struggles in their lives. And that was the beginning of when we got more involved and got some degrees in counseling and so on. We got into doing what we're doing. But we learned the hard way. We didn't know enough. And we're hoping to give you lots of information to be able to get started at this particular point. Because God called you to meet these names. You know who the people are that do the best at this? The ones that have had the problem before. Or the people that you're like a magnet. Everybody just comes to you and uh, wants to talk to you. You're the type of person that to open everyone just comes to you. But see, there are people in this room that God is calling. Maybe even to make this a full-time ministry. Or at least make it a part-time ministry of helping in your church. Or setting up a support group, which is the beginning of this whole thing and the way we started. Do we need support groups, life coaches, or counselors to help hurting people in our church or organization? Am I called? And what am I willing to do to follow God's call in my life? You can look, go to our website if you want to and look at, we have 15 courses, 10 lessons each. That's about 120 hours of videotape on our website. And we're giving all of that to Brother British and Life Challenge. They'll have it all available here. These are one of our little support groups, people being trained. These are some comments that they made. There's nothing else like helping hurting people. Now I know what God has really called me to do. You know what God has really called me to do. Too much of it.